We are here tonight to celebrate the incredible book that my beloved has just written called Hope in the 11th Hour. And so can we tell Sarah Berger, thank you for her hard work. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah! Thank you. It's Jesus' fault. You did it. Jesus did that. We're Jesus grateful. Did that. We're grateful. I'm so, grateful. Yeah. It's a surprise it's, around every corner. That's right. Yeah. It, it wasn't anything that you determined to do. It was something no. that the Lord spoke and you obeyed. Yes. And so here we are. And Jesus just did it. Yeah. Yeah. That's fantastic. Um, so we're here to celebrate and to dedicate the book, but also to share truth. Truth that's in the book, truth that people need to hear, truth that is going to help equip you. Mm -hmm. now, now listen to us. There's one thing at least that we all have in common, without question. Every one of us in this room, every person watching this online has this in common. We are going to face our natural bodies dying. We're all going to face that. We're going to face it personally, and we're going to face it with people that we know and love. And having walked through this some years ago in a very personal and painful way, um, we know how important it is to be able to equip people. Right. Yes. Now listen to me, for your own life, but also for people that you're gonna come in contact with that you're, you have to be able to minister to them. You, you just have to. As a follower of Jesus, you, you need to have this stuff so in your heart, not just in your head, but in your heart, that you can share it. So we, we want you to be equipped. We want you to get equipped for your own self, but for the people that you're gonna be in contact with because you are gonna come in contact with people that need heaven's hope, for sure. So that's part of what our goal is tonight. Mm -hmm. The key to it, friends, the key to being able to grieve with hope and have hope in the 11th hour is to have an eternal perspective. Yep eternal perspective. This, this is the deal maker or the deal breaker, mm -hmm. having eternal perspective. And so we jotted down a few things here and uh, we can run through them real yeah, quick right I, now. I wanna speak to the book really quick. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, want, I want everyone here to understand the purpose behind writing the book. It really was to pass on to my children and grandchildren to give them um, a love for eternity. The purpose was to plant and instill in their hearts fearlessness when it comes to death. Yeah. And so the book is filled with how God speaks to us when we're walking through grief in the intimate ways that he's spoken to me. And I, I believe he'll use that as a holy crowbar in some folks' life that feel really stuck in grief and need to move forward. I think he'll, he'll use the stories, I'm certain he will, but you guys, sincerely, one of the biggest deals right now that's on my heart is that we would live fearlessly for the kingdom because Jesus came to defeat death, hell, and the grave, yeah. and we should be living fearlessly for Christ. Christians should not be living in fear, okay? Because of the last few years and what the church has experienced, I'm hoping that people will fall crazy in love with eternity and long for it, desire for heaven. Yeah. You know, it, it says in Matthew that blessed is he who when the master comes is found watching. You are blessed for just watching and paying attention to his coming and the signs and, and what's going on in the world. You are blessed. And then, and then it goes on to say, whether he comes in the first watch or the second or the third, blessed are you who watch. So he may not come on our watch. He may come on the next watch, but we are supposed to be a people that are watching for his coming and longing for our homeland. That's right. Yeah. So there you go. 
Yeah, I was, I was talking to uh, some friends the other day going in for a quintuple bypass uh, the next day yeah. and um, just, you know, encouraging, praying with them at church and all. And um, I said, now listen, I don't believe this is gonna happen to you at all. I don't think you're gonna go to heaven on the table tomorrow morning. I said, but what you need to know is you shouldn't be scared about heaven. There's this great little saying I heard years ago, you can't scare me with heaven. Yeah. And, and friends, I promise you, if, if we can become more heavenly minded, mm -hmm. if we can know and understand where we're gonna be spending eternity, <coughs> it's going to take away the fear that Sarah was talking yeah. about. It's going to get rid of the fear of death. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is one of the biggest things that COVID exposed in the church that people who are supposed to really know and love the resurrection and the life and have the hope of heaven were actually terrified of death. Yeah, right. yeah. And so we, we need to acknowledge that if that's in us, then like we've got to start making some adjustments here in our relationship with God. Yeah, to grieve with hope. Grieve to with hope. To make much of heaven that's right. and much of Jesus. Yeah. yeah. So honey, if we're gonna talk about eternal perspective yes. and really having a mindset that's biblical and not cultural, mm -hmm. because I'm telling you, there's a massive difference. Far too much of the church grieves culturally yeah. and not biblically. Mm -hmm. And so if we were to talk about how to have eternal perspective, what are just some of the things, some of our favorite things that, that yeah. we've discussed? Some of our favorite things. Could I have a bottle of water, somebody? Is there some? Right here, ma'am. Thank you. I do have a little allergy Allow me to coppers. open it for you. Thank you, dude. Love you. <laughs> mm. Thank you so much. Um, so really early, early on after our Josiah went to heaven, you know, people, well-meaning people would approach and say, I'm so sorry you lost your son. Or I'm, you know, something in regards to death. And the Holy Spirit immediately just caused this friction. Like evaluate what's being said, you guys. Really take, take to heart what's being said. Is that truth? Is that biblical truth to refer to a child or loved one as being lost when we actually know that they are in heaven? They're not lost at all. We know that our loved one in Christ, those in Christ that have passed on are not lost at all. They are in the kingdom and they're wildly alive. And to refer to a saint a born again believer that's passed away as being dead has never felt right with us at all, you guys. It doesn't seem biblically sound. We, we just make much about every jot and tittle in the word and I can't find a place where it ever talks about a saint as being dead, except for at the tomb of Lazarus when Jesus, because the disciples didn't understand his terminology, he used the term sleep over Lazarus, and the disciples didn't understand, so he had to use plain language, and he used the term, Lazarus is dead. But it wasn't his first go-to. He would have rather said the word sleep because he knew that was, there was an eternal thing happening here. But we use the term, go, went to heaven. We always use the term, Josiah's gone to heaven, or yeah. he went to heaven, he's alive in heaven. Yeah. yeah. And see, that's what, that's what having a, a biblical, eternal perspective is about. It has to change your language. Mm -hmm. It has to change your language. What you believe in your heart is what? It's what's gonna come out of your mouth. Out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth speaks. Mm -hmm. And so we speak Bible. We speak life, we speak alive. We don't speak dead and death and loss. Mm -mm. And, and if you'll find yourself incorporating biblical truth, you'll find yourself grieving, but with hope because it's rooted in the word and the truth of God. Mm -hmm. John 11, 25 and 26, right? Yep. Were you gonna share that right now? No, no, you're gonna share that. I'm okay. gonna expound on it a little okay, bit. Okay, but remember, we've got seven other things okay. here, so. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> Listen, it, G Jesus said it this simple. Mm -hmm. He said, I'm the resurrection and the life, mm -hmm. okay? He said, he who lives and believes in me, now listen to this, he who lives and believes in me, though he may die, yet shall he live. Mm -hmm. And this is the only place in the scripture where I find Jesus taking a second and going, let me make this clearer. 
because he then says, he who lives and believes in me shall never die. They're at a funeral. Yeah. He who lives and believes in me shall never die. And then he says to everybody there at the funeral, do you believe this? Because friends, what you believe about Jesus being resurrection and life and what you believe about people who have gone to heaven, what you believe about that matters. Yes. What you believe about that is going to determine how you grieve. You're either gonna grieve with hope or you're gonna grieve with negativity and lost and loss and death and all of the things that just are so cultural, but they're not biblical. They're not biblical. Do you believe this, he said. Yeah. It matters. Yeah. And I, I'm certain most of you, most all of you would know the entire story about Lazarus. And when Jesus called forth, Lazarus, come forth. And they, they had already rolled the stone away. And Lazarus came forth, what? Wrapped in grave clothes. Yeah. And the first thing that Jesus said is loose him. And I, I want to, this is so tender, you guys, especially for moms, because, and, and dads that have lost children, it's lost, I'm sorry to use that term, but that have children that go to heaven before you do. We know that's, for one, we were created for eternity, period. If the fall hadn't happened, we would never have had, had experienced death. Jesus hates death, that's why he came to destroy it, that's okay? Right. But I, I wanna make this point about loosing and taking off Lazarus' grave clothes, and especially for a parent who has a child in heaven. I want to tell you to take all thoughts captive in regards to what your child looks like right now. Your child is redeemed and whole and fully recognizable. We know like we will recognize Josiah. He's just that much more rad, you know? So I'm just saying people have a tendency to allow the enemy to come in and you, moms, dads, you're supposed to dwell on what's happening right now in the reality of a tent that's not alive anymore. Don't go that route, you guys. Entertain and visualize the truth, the truth, not some pretend thing, the truth that your child, your loved one is wildly alive. I, I mentioned in the book, like I, when I think of Josiah, I always think of him in a sunny beach billabong t-shirt and shorts. That's how I see Josiah. So take off this impression of death Loose your child, your loved one from what you are seeing and start seeing them in the truth of how fully alive they are in the kingdom of heaven. That's right. Take the grave clothes off. Take them off. Loose them and let them go. Yes. That's right. Yes. So have an eternal perspective, man. You've got to realize that, that every follower of Jesus who, who transitions is in heaven and is alive without question. Our second point that we like to talk about yes. uh, is 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 4, that talks about the fact that people who have gone to heaven, and this is just, it, it expounds and is an, it expands on what we just talked about, but 2 Corinthians 5, 4 says, talks about how believers in heaven have actually been swallowed by life. Yes. Fully overtaken and swallowed by life itself. And so when you think about that, there is no room for death. There right. is no room for right. grave clothes. There is no room for anything yeah. but life because they've been overcome, completely swallowed by life itself. Right. And we, you know, and it's, it's again, you guys, it's a challenge when you're walking through grief as a Christian because you are butted up against culture all the time. All the time. Christians, all of us speaking what's cultural and not biblically sound. And when I think of that being swallowed up by life, it immediately reminds me of the truth that our eternal home is heaven. It's more real than this earth actually is. Okay, we're in the shadow of heaven. 
Heaven is not the shadow of earth, you guys. Right. And we tend to, and we really need to repent and get our minds set correctly that heaven is far better, far better than earth, you guys. We clench, oh no, we don't wanna lose this, we don't wanna lose this. You know, I don't wanna go to heaven yet because I wanna live out the rest of my life. I'm just telling you, heaven isn't a ripoff. Heaven is not a ripoff. It's not okay? a downgrade. It's not a downgrade. Heaven is not a downgrade. So if that would free some people of the fear of yes. like, I've got to live my life out. And you know, what about Rue when, um, when Saya first went to heaven and you would be praying in the shower? Yeah. What, what was that first thing he well, met no, you it with? It was the pivotal moment. You yeah. know, I'm, I'm literally, in, I'm sorry for the graphic, but I'm literally in the floor of my shower mm -hmm. just grappling with all of this, you know? And just thinking about, man, no, you know, my son's not going to get married. He's not going to have kids. He's, you know, what's, he's not going to have this future and what's his profession going to be. And just thinking, because this was brand new when it all had just happened and we didn't have our hearts wrapped around all this yet. Yeah. Just thinking about all of the things that would be lost. Mm -hmm. And if I've ever heard God in my life, I heard him laying, sitting naked in the floor of my shower. And he said, I've made up, more than made up for all of those things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm telling you, it was, it was salve to my soul. Yes. I've more than made up for all of those things. Mm. And I went, of course you did. Yeah. That's why it's called heaven. Yes, yeah. To I be absent from the body, number three, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Second Corinthians chapter five, verse eight. Yeah, so this is really cool, you guys, but um, the Lord, way back when, kept repeating that verse in my mind. I'm sure all of us here have that verse memorized. And I'm going, Lord, I know it's, it's beautiful. I love that verse and I embrace that verse. But after so much repetition, I thought maybe he's hanging something else on that verse too. So I went to my Strong's Concordance and you guys, I'm just telling you, New King James didn't do it justice. <sighs> In the Strong's, in the literal Greek language, it means to be absent means to immigrate. And to be present with the Lord means to be in the homeland with the Lord. I mean, look it up, Teresa, it's crazy. Literally in the Greek. So properly spoken, to immigrate from your body is to be in the homeland with the Lord. I mean, that helps, doesn't that? It's just a change of location. You know, it's just moving on and to the place that we sincerely call home. Um, with a point, you guys, in regards to the repetition that the Holy Spirit was speaking, and especially for those that are walking through grief that feel like they might not be hearing from God, pay attention to repeat when the Lord repeats things. Um, in Job 33, verses 29 and 30, it says this, Behold, God works all these things twice, in fact, three times with a man to bring back his soul from the pit that he may be enlightened with the light of life. So the Holy Spirit in his mercy, he, I mean, that's how he speaks anyhow, but if we miss it the first time and you hear it again and you're thinking of something again or a scripture, go with it. Inquire of the Lord because he might have a nugget that will literally give you your next breath. That's right. Because the grief is, we're 13 years into it. Yeah. I cried every day for 10 months, you guys. I mean, that's the reality of having a child go to heaven. Yeah. Number four. Okay. Being surrounded by a cloud of witnesses. We're talking about having an eternal perspective. What does it look like? We have to realize that our loved ones are alive, they're not dead, they've been swallowed by life, they're, they've immigrated into their homeland, yes. our homeland, and then mysteriously, we're surrounded by a cloud of witnesses. Hebrews chapter 12, verse one, talks about us being surrounded. And again, another one of these weird Greek words that isn't just, it's not just poetry, it's, it's it's the literal word picture of us having the saints around us who are couched about us. Yeah. Relaxed around us. 
Here's the issue with grief, isn't it? Doesn't it really boil down to one word, separation? Yeah. And so when the scripture lets us know that this separation that we feel isn't complete and isn't total, yeah. but that we're actually surrounded by our loved ones in Christ who get to, who get to be eyewitnesses from heaven's balcony mm -hmm. and, and they're relaxed about it and couched about us. Yeah. I mean, that's eternal perspective. Yeah. Yeah. Looking through the veil and seeing our loved ones there, participating and knowing to whatever degree God allows. I'm not saying every single thing they get to watch, that would be a little weird, but as much things as are redemptive and hope giving. Yeah, right, right. Do you, honey, I didn't, I should have worn glasses. I can't, can you quote that scripture from memory or read the entirety of it? It's important right now. Yeah, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the hindrance the weight and the hindrance and the sin that so easily besets us. Mm -hmm. Ensnares us. Ensnares us. Since they're watching from heaven, mm -hmm. this is a motivator for us to get it right. Yeah. It's a holy accountability, you guys. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, there's something really beautiful we know about being accountable to Jesus. Of course, when we're one on one with Jesus, He's always watching, and we have got an accountability before our king. But there's something, he knows that we're human, and he knows that we're family, that we love our family and friends. And there's some just added degree of power, I, I want to say, in knowing that Josiah is watching how mom and dad are walking this out. And I more than once, many times over, thought, Father, I want to make my son proud. I want him to see his mom walking out the rest of her life knowing that he's alive in heaven and making much of that. You know, when Jesus was getting ready to leave this earth and um, he mentioned to his disciples that you should be happy for me, yeah. that I go to my father. You know, you can take that and apply that certainly toward our loved ones that go to heaven too. I think once they're there and they're experiencing the glory of it and the fullness of it, we'll ne we won't understand it fully, obviously, until we get there. But I know that Josiah is so happy that his mom and dad, sisters, brother, friends, know that he's wildly alive and know that he, at any moment when the Lord might pull back the veil, that he's allowed to peer in, yeah. you know, and cheer us on, certainly to cheer us on. But that scripture, we always have looked at it like we're just surrounded. No, no, no. It's about accountability. It's Both. about accountability. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, talk about eternal perspective. What, what Sarah mentioned a minute ago about what Jesus said. He said, if you love, love me, me, you'll be, happy. you will be happy. You'll rejoice when I say I'm returning to my father. Why, because it's a downgrade in heaven? No, it's a serious upgrade. Yeah. And if you love someone, you're gonna be happy for them that they're getting upgraded. Yeah, now those are real conversations yeah. when you're, you're a parent or None of it's widow. trite. None of it's trite. This is like the deep things of the Lord to go before him and say, help me, Father, help me by your spirit change my heart, give me the proper perspective that I can rejoice and be happy with my, that my son, yeah. you know, happy for him. Um, I'm going to fast forward for a second, honey, and say this, because I think this is important. You guys, this book is chock full of dreams that the Lord gave me. And one of them definitely was pivotal. It was probably a year and a half after Sai went to heaven. And in a nutshell, I'll consolidate it, honey. But he was a, a little boy, only four years old, and he was kissing me on my left cheek. And we're looking at each other, and he looks at me and he goes, Mom, you know I'm mature, and you know I'm alive in heaven. And I said, yes, buddy, I know you're a mature man of God, and you are alive in heaven. And it was, it was so real, you guys, but I knew in waking that literally, Josiah was so happy 
that I knew he was alive. It meant so much to him that I was getting it. And I mean, every, everything in a dream you need to bring before the Lord and test it with scripture, but it definitely was a word from God. And every parent, if you know that your child is okay, aren't you okay? You know that they're, I knew he was okay in heaven. We knew he was okay in heaven. We, we were well aware of that that there were degrees of knowing. And about a year and a half later, it was like, now, mom really gets it. She fully is embracing that I am active and alive in the kingdom of God. Yeah. See, this is what eternal mindset and perspective does for you. It's, I I tell people this, everybody ought to read every verse in their Bible they've never highlighted. Just, just read those that you've never highlighted. And what you'll find out is you'll start reading all of these verses about eternal life that yep. you've never really thought yeah. to apply to your life in the here and now. Yeah. Uh, let's get on to our, our fifth point okay. and, and pick up the pace just a little bit, okay. uh, Pastor Steve. Um, <laughs> if we're surrounded by a cloud of witnesses and they're able to know whatever God allows them to know about our lives here and now, um, that's a pretty interesting thought. Yes. And so we go in, in Luke's gospel, chapter 9, and, and specifically verse 31, but it's, it's verses before and after that, uh, this issue of the transfiguration of Jesus. And there's this amazing thing that happens where Jesus is with Peter, James, and John, and they're up on what is now called the mountain of transfiguration. And it says that Jesus is praying. And while he's praying... Moses and Elijah show up in the midst of him praying. Now, how long had Moses been in heaven at that point? 1,500 years. How long had Elijah been in heaven at that point? 800 years. They show up from heaven because when you're in heaven, you're alive. And it says in Matthew, excuse me, Luke chapter 9, verse 31, that they begin to speak to Jesus about his departure as he moves into Jerusalem. They knew from heaven, and the Greek word for departure there is actually exodus, his exodus. They knew from heaven what Jesus' purpose and plan was on earth and that he was going to be exiting from Jerusalem as he rose from the grave and re-entered heaven. They knew from heaven what was happening on earth. And so again, this isn't just some poetry or some kind of hopeful thing. Like I've got script, I've got scripture chapter and verse over and over and over again. Revelation chapter six, verse 10 talks about those souls who had been martyred and they were under the altar in heaven. And it said that they cried out with a loud voice saying, how long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth. What did they know in heaven? That God hadn't yet judged those who had martyred them. They knew from heaven. And so this concept, y'all, of our loved ones in heaven, uh, I don't want to be crass, but sitting on a cloud in a robe, plucking a harp, that's hell, that's not heaven. Yeah, you know, another point, honey, that like you guys, we all know that the saints rejoice in heaven when people are saved. That's a verse right there in the word. So we know those things, but until you need it that's right. on, a, on that eternal level, you just glaze past it. But the Holy Spirit, you can trust, will bring all scripture to remembrance, like it says in the word, he's our helper, and he will remind you of things that he's spoken to you. Yeah. And um, it'll mean so much more, there'll be so much more depth to it. God spoke to you something awesome, number six, about having eternal perspective. Uh, Philippians chapter one, verse six. Yes, um, okay, so the Holy Spirit was repeating this thing to me about Josiah being a warrior. And I was, you know, and I didn't recognize it as being the Lord. It was just this fleeting thought several times over. And I finally was talking to the Lord about it and just going, wait, I know there's armies of heaven and we're part of the armies of heaven, but I'd never really thought of saints in heaven as being part, you know, like warriors. So 
one day I just stood still in the kitchen and inquired of the Lord, like, is this you, Lord? Like, you, Josiah was created to be a warrior. He loved Kung Fu. He almost signed up in the military. Um, he definitely has this warrior spirit. Is that you talking to me? And I mean, at God's speed, yeah. the Lord spoke, for I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. And do you, do you know what he said? Do you get it, you guys? Like, immediately I knew the day of Christ Jesus hasn't happened. And he unpacked to me that, like, Sarah, the, the veil is of no consequence to a believer. When you receive Christ on this side of the veil, you become eternal at that point. The veil doesn't stop the gifting. You go right through, and the gifts go right through with you. So Josiah wasn't ripped off from opportunities here on this side, and nor is your loved one that's a part of the kingdom. They are still operating in that gifting. In until that calling. The, in that calling yeah. until the day of Christ Jesus. Yeah. So that's, sho that's just shocking good news, right? Yeah. Again, not sitting isolated on a cloud with a harp and a white robe doing nothing no. for all eternity. Just, just go through and read the book of Revelation and see how much work and service and worship is happening. Heaven is a busy place. Mm -hmm. We're, we're going to be overseeing this. Jesus said very, very clearly, the word of God tells us very clearly that we'll be given different amounts of responsibility based on our mm -hmm. fruitfulness here on earth. Mm -hmm. And so we have to set our minds, therefore, Colossians chapter three, verse one, set our minds on things above where Christ is at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, verse two, not on things of the earth. We've got to be more heavenly minded. Yes. If we're more heavenly minded, we'll have more heavenly hope and we'll be able to help people that are grieving and feel hopeless. We'll be able to share the gospel with them. And we'll be more brave. That's right. Point number seven. There's a great reuniting Hallelujah. that's going to happen. Eww. That seems to be the one thing we kind of get right, but we're not real sure about it because we're not real sure about the rest of this. I'm telling you, there is a reuniting that is going to happen. You're going to see your loved ones in Christ again. Again, this isn't just bumper sticker, refrigerator, magnet Christianity. This is the word of God. I love it. Ephesians 1.10. God is going to gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. There is going to be a great reunion, and I can't wait for that day amen people amen. ask questions well do you think my kid will recognize me in heaven or my oh, husband boy. will recognize me in heaven he's been watching you the whole time yeah yeah, yeah. i love that first thessalonians 4 17 and 18 talks about when jesus comes back and he talks about this fact that we mm -hmm. we shall always be with the lord with those who are in heaven we will always be together and then what does he say in verse 18 comfort, comfort one another with these words comfort one another with these words mm -hmm. that means jesus wants us to know these truths so we can pass these truths on to other people so that when we're facing our own grief right? Then we know what word to, to allow to wash over ourselves yeah. so we can experience comfort. Yes. Because mm -hmm. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3 and 4, mm -hmm. he is the God of, of all, all comfort. comfort. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, the God of all comfort, you guys, you know, that sounds great. And then when you start experiencing that all and realizing how, what extreme measures the Lord takes for the brokenhearted. That's, well, that's part of my burden, is just opening the eyes of the brokenhearted because I think God is speaking all the time yeah. and we have a tendency to miss how he's speaking and the language he might be using. So the God of all comfort means 
He is the God of all things. He can do whatever he wants by whatever means he deems well to minister hope to you, to bring comfort. And it's usually outside of our human bubble, yeah. you know, outside of box. the box that we put the Lord in. Yeah. Yeah, that's put correctly. Yeah. yeah. So he's the God of all comfort. It yeah. doesn't mean that he just comforts us mm -hmm. entirely. It means he's the God of all comfort and he can personally yeah. fashion yes. comfort for you. Whatever that looks like, whatever is going to comfort you might not be what comforts me, but if it's what's best for you, mm -hmm. That's how he will personally fashion it yes. for you. Yes. And he'll fashion it. Listen, th this is a whole nother deal. And I want to take 10 seconds on this. It's important. Husbands and wives are going to grieve differently, y'all. Mm -hmm. You need to give each other the grace to do that. Mm -hmm. We're going to grieve differently. We're going to get comfort differently. But we have to be able to give each other the grace to do that. Yeah. To, to let God comfort you in the way that you need to be comforted mm -hmm. and if sarah gets comforted in a way where i'm scratching my head going babe i'm glad that works for you <laughs> or if true. i get comforted yeah. in a way where she goes well, that's got to be a dad thing i don't get it well then we understand yeah. he's the god of all comfort yeah. and there's nothing that limits him from comforting us personally yeah the, in, you know a sad truth is that the majority of married couples don't survive yeah. a child going to heaven. Yeah. And so that grace, allowing each other the grace to be ministered in their own unique way is really, really important. Yeah. Yeah. Some of the scriptures, and we'll, we'll kind of wrap it up here yeah. in just a moment, but, you know, um, Psalm 34, verse 18. I mean, we're looking for things to, to experience comfort ourselves or to give comfort to other people to realize Psalm 34 verse 18, that God is near mm -hmm. to the brokenhearted. Yeah. There's, there's something about the goodness of God as a loving father mm -hmm. where brokenheartedness causes him whew, to sweep in yeah. and draw near. Yeah. But see, if you don't know that God does that, you're gonna miss it, yes. y'all. Don't miss it. He's that good. Allow him to draw near. Mm -hmm. Then, he's not just there as a spectator. I mean, uh, th there's multiple places where this is mentioned. I'm just yeah. going to give you one. But the exact same thing is mm -hmm. said each time. Isaiah 61, Luke 4, 18. He doesn't just draw near to the brokenhearted. He heals the brokenhearted. Yes. Why would God heal the brokenhearted? Because he's the God of all comfort. Yes. Yeah. This is what he specializes in. Mm -hmm. This is why he came, as Sarah said earlier, to defeat death, hell, and the grave. Mm -hmm. This is why the book of Hebrews says that, that Jesus came to deliver us, listen to this, from the fear of death. Yes. We're not to be people who fear death. Why would we fear everything that God has in store for us mm -hmm. for all of eternity. Why would we fear heaven? Yeah. Time for a checkup from the neck yeah. up. Yeah. You know, what, this is an interesting thing that I discovered in the word, but that near actually means allied. Yeah. So that, that means something different, right? Not only near, but he is with you. He's on your side. He's not the one that's fighting against your healing, you guys. I mean, it is the truth and it's awful, but when you are vulnerable and going, walking through grief, the enemy doesn't give a rip. Oh my gosh. He is not compassionate. He will, he will come in and try to absolutely wipe you out. So take into consideration that God is allied mm. with you. He is your ally when you don't even know how to fight yeah. because you are so brokenhearted he is fighting for you that's right he is fighting for you he wants to see you through to the other side of this very difficult journey yeah yeah so i'm gonna do this next part all by myself because mrs burger won't be comfortable doing it uh-oh by 
her book. <laughs> oh my gosh. Buy <laughs> her oh, no! book. Oh my gosh. We've got them here available tonight. I don't know how many. We've got a, a short supply of them. You can go online, buy the book. Then after you buy the book, buy other books to give them away, to put them in the hands of people who are hurting. Yeah. You, you never, never know. You never know. 15 minutes after kissing Sarah on the cheek, Sai was gone. 15 minutes. We weren't planning on this. There were parents today in St. Louis, Missouri, who sent their kids off just to another day of school. There's at least three of them that aren't coming home. That happened today in our country. Again, another school shooting. I'm just telling you all, We've got to get serious about this thing and communicate the hope that is in Jesus who conquered death, hell, and the grave, who has heaven waiting for those who want it and love him. Come on, yeah. let's get the good news out. Let's get yeah. the gospel out. Yeah. This is a tangible way yeah. to do it. We stand up and dedicate? Yep, okay, so we're gonna, we're gonna finish the night out Ladies, come on up. Jen Hesse, come on up as well. Come on. Teresa, come on, come on, Teresa. Susan, come, come on, on up. Susan. Where's Jennifer? You can come right come over here, up, you push your way through the veil, come up on we're stage. We're going to pray over the we're, book we're, real quick. We're going to. It's the family of God tonight. Jackie, can I borrow your book? This, this, is, this is our project. This isn't mine and Sarah's. This is ours. This is the body of Christ for the body of Thank Christ. You, girl. We're going to lay hands on it. So okay. we're going to dedicate this book sweet and eyes. the ministry that comes with this book you ready y'all come on can you stretch your hands out yeah you come on this way yeah yeah let's mm -hmm. pray together father in the name of jesus mm -hmm. First of all, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for eternal life. We thank you that Jesus called himself the resurrection and the life. We thank you that you're the God of all comfort. We're thankful that you give us hope, yes, even in the 11th hour. And so, Lord, now as your family, as the body of Christ, we together dedicate this book to you for your cause and for your kingdom and for the healing of hurting people. God, would you take this book to unusual places far and wide, Lord, would you deposit it sovereignly in every person's heart and hand that needs it? Lord, and may the fruit be real and tangible, lasting, life-giving, hope-giving, God. Would you move powerfully through this book, oh God, and we were gonna be the first people to give you all of the praise and the honor and the glory. God, use hope in the 11th hour to glorify yourself, we pray now. We celebrate and dedicate this book to you in the wonderful, matchless, life-giving name of Jesus, who is the Christ. Christ yes. in Jesus name Jesus. and God's heaven bound happy people said amen amen, amen. amen. and amen amen thank you, thank you. I'll stay up here for just a second we call call my buddies up here and not everybody knows I want to introduce everybody <laughs> yeah. you guys I just want to give honor where honor is due Jennifer Hesse, dear Jen, we've known her for many, many years, and she helped, helped edit our first book, Half Heart. Yeah. And Jen helped me for over a year, cleaning up, grammar, redundant, <laughs> just made it, made the manuscript just so clean and so precious, saying yes and helping me. And then Teresa Evanson is my precious agent from William K. Jensen um, Literary Agency. And she has just been, you guys, you know the burgers and how we roll and how we really believe Jesus for all things? She's that chick too, okay? And then this is Susan McPherson, my acquisitions editor from David C. Cook. And she's a local in Spring Hill. So Jesus provided the most wonderful women to surround me during this process. I just, I'm not gonna go through and name everybody, but there's several endorsers here, and I thank you so much, and so many people here in this crowd that are mentioned in the book, and you guys, I just love you so much, and thank you for letting King Jesus 
use your names for the expansion of his kingdom and to heal some folks. So yeah. anyhow, love you so, so much. So you guys, we have cake outside the door and it's super beautiful. Let's and get the cake, y'all. Enough of this. And all of that. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming, you guys. We'll see you next time. God bless time. you guys. Have a great night. Thank you so much.